I think we're still waiting, so I'm not sure if we started, but this is a lot more awkward than actually being on stage, isn't it? Okay, looks like the session has started. Okay, uh, we started, so let's uh, get the road in our show, um, road. Uh, very good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening on the Mata COVID-19 Bread and Butter Series 1 of 3. Uh, tonight's uh, topic is uh, about protecting the tourism workforce. Uh, and of course, before we go into the uh, topic proper, uh, we have with us tonight uh, a very special guest, and I would like to introduce them to all of you before we continue. Uh, we have with us, of course, uh, YB Dr. Sri Haja Nancy Shukrin, who is the Minister of Tourism, Arts and Culture, Malaysia. And uh, just to give you a quick background on, uh, on YB, uh, she has an Executive Master's in Business Administration from Ohio University. Uh, she served with the Estate of the Law Division in the Kuching North City Hall uh, and also the Chairman of the Sarawak Federation of Women's Institute. She was also Political Secretary to the Sarawak Chief Minister and up until 2018, a Minister in the Prime Minister's Department uh, who took charge of multiple portfolios including Law, uh, the Land Public Transport Commission, I think where we first met Wadi, uh, yeah. Malaysian Nuclear Power Corporation, Innovation Agency, uh, the Malaysian Industry Government Group for Higher Technology, just to name a few. And I believe you are also a businesswoman and at one point in time had a training consultancy firm. Is that correct? That's why we... 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> Quite a lengthy no one. <laughs> I'll try and keep it short. Um, next up, we have with us Datuk Sri Ko Yok King. Uh, many will fondly know him as uh, Ko San. Uh, he is the Group Managing Director for Apple Vacations. Uh, with 30 years of experience in the tourism industry, and he has done almost everything uh, from tour guiding to conducting tours, destination marketing, uh, and I believe he started specializing in Japan uh, at the early stages and still is a Japan specialist to today, among many other things. Uh, he's also helped Apple Vacations form strategic partnerships uh, with various sectors and includes everything from banks to airlines to international golfing associations. I don't play golf that much, really, but it uh, looks like I have to pick that up. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yeah, next up, thank, you, course, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Datu Haji Shamsuddin, uh, the Executive Director for the Malaysian Employees Federation, uh, which employs a team consisting of 30 professional staff, 20 support staff, MEF members, number more than 6,000 ordinary members, and 25 associations, and employing more than 3.8 million employees. And last but not least, we have Mr. K. Central Basan, partner and corporate lawyer at Basan Chan and Chandran, uh, with more than 20 years uh, of uh, practice in this field of experience, mainly corporate and commercial law. And he regularly advises companies, shareholders and stakeholders uh, on a variety of corporate and commercial law issues. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for thank being on the show tonight. Thank you. Yep. Now, just to kick things off, before we go and uh, into the individual panelists, uh, today we are faced with a very dire circumstance where the COVID-19 pandemic has not just affected the local tourism industry, but has affected the global tourism industry, which actually does not bode very well for the tourism industry in general. And one of the key issues that have come up during this time, although it's across the board, uh, is the issue of retaining valuable tourism manpower. And this is even more frightening for the tourism industry because a, of the number of people that is employed in the tourism industry in Malaysia, uh, which is about close to 1.5 directly and 3.5 million indirectly. And also because it is the second largest income generator for the country. Now, a recent poll conducted by Mata among its members, uh, more than 300 respondents, uh, indicated that up to today, more than 62.5% of uh, travel agencies are either currently undergoing retrenchment or planning retrenchment or corporate restructuring exercises. Now, even up to today, uh, as of March, more than 50% of staff have been asked to take unpaid leave and more than 63% have been asked to go on staff salary reductions. Now, this is only up until March, but indications also say that the expected staff retrenchment uh, on the travel agency side is close to 31.64%, which is an alarming number. Uh, following up to that, we also released another survey, which was the response of travel agencies to the pre hunting plus packages. And in general, the market is a bit divided. 50% uh, say the wage subsidy program uh, has benefited that company, while 50% obviously said no. Uh, a similar number, 41%, uh, indicated that re rental waivers did, uh, helped their company, while 60% uh, said it did not. Uh, on the special grants and zero interest loans for the company, 52% indicated yes, it did help, while 48% said no. And last but not least, uh, we also asked how much of the workforce travel agents were considering retrenching within the next three months. And the largest 50% uh, um, or more, 26.5% of respondents indicated that they would be retrenching half their staff. Now, given that, of course, there are many things that the government has been doing and that individual travel agents have been doing to cope with the situation. And so tonight, what we're going to look at is how the private sector is actually adapting to the situation, what the current pain points are, and how they are formulating various strategies to retain their manpower and their talent. We will also be 
uh, asking YB Nancy on some of the plans that Motec has moving forward to help the industry retain the valuable manpower uh, and have them ready to get back on their feet once recovery starts in earnest. And last but not least, we'll also be fielding a couple of questions to Dr. Sham and to Central on some of the practical situations, uh, realistic situations that travel agencies are facing in terms of retaining that manpower and how to go about as employers managing that resource. So, uh, without hesitation, I would like to uh, quickly get into the meat of the matter. And to sort of kickstart the session, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sri Ko to give us an idea of what the current situation is that travel agents are facing on the ground today and what the impact to the tourism sector here in Malaysia is like. How long will we start to see recovery and what are the major pain points when it comes to retaining that manpower in business? Dr. Sri, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you. And I think Niger have uh, given a very good uh, statistic to all the survey uh, in the market. But uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, this uh, COVID-19, in fact, it started on the uh, 22nd of January, uh, which is somewhere uh, in Chinese New Year. But subsequently, it had uh, developed to a uh, verb uh, Pandemic. So with the uh, situation that we have now, uh, I think the, most of the agency, uh, whether it's inbound or whether it's uh, outbound, and uh, the problem that we are facing uh, is lots of cancellation. Uh, I would say 90% uh, of our tour is being cancelled. Uh, That's our first, first challenge. The second challenge is uh, immediate the uh, tour being cancelled uh, by our customer and uh, they came in for refund and uh, for their deposit or for their payment. Uh, but we are having difficulty that uh, our supplier, uh, for example, uh, like airline, uh, they are not uh, doing the uh, direct uh, refund to all the agency at this moment. They means to say they will go for a credit sales system. Uh, they means to say we are allowed to use the money in future. Uh, that is our second challenge. The third challenge is at this moment, uh, because of the uh, COVID-19, I think our business uh, is considered the total loss business. It means to say, we do not have new customers seeing uh, fabric. And uh, that is our uh, three challenge at this moment. If you ask me what is the uh, impact uh, for tourism, you know, uh, in fact, Malaysia, and uh, we have just launched our Visit Malaysia year, uh, 2020 in uh, I think 31st of December and uh, in fact we are expecting about 30 uh, millions of visitors to Malaysia and at the same time we are also expecting to have uh, 100 billions of uh, revenue uh, with the present situation I think it's not uh, possible uh, it's not possible and uh, that's why the, uh, 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 all the uh, travel agency or uh, all the, the uh, industrial uh, Trudeau and Russia players are in a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, maybe I should put it in Korea, zero business situation at this moment. And uh, the other question that you, uh, we are talking about, how long it will take uh, for that uh, to uh, recover? And uh, personally, I would think that it might have to take about six to nine months. And the reason why it needs to take about five to uh, six to nine months, uh, basically, uh, traveling is something called it, uh, it's not a, a necessity. And uh, basically, uh, I think the traveling confidence is very important. Uh, at this moment, I think most of the people would not think of traveling. Uh, that's one. But even they want to think about traveling, they have a lot of uh, travel restrictions, uh, which a lot of countries already locked down. Uh, like in Malaysia, we are having MCO. Uh, uh, Singapore, they are having cracker breaker. That means to say we are not allowed to go and uh, we are not allowed to go and we are not allowed to come back. So I think it's very difficult. So uh, as I say, uh, it will take about uh, six to nine months. And uh, the other question is, uh, we are talking about retaining the manpower uh, in our business. Uh, this is a very difficult uh, uh, problem. This is a very difficult situation. And uh, it is uh, 
very difficult uh, situation that all the businessmen have to deal with. But uh, if we would like to solve the problem, I think uh, I wonder the wonder the uh, possibility we need to have a capita uh, corporation. Uh, what do you mean by capita uh, corporation? That means to say, uh, being an employer, uh, we must allow to have uh, either pay cut or either unpaid leave uh, as a side. And uh, our employer also uh, have to compromise and have to allow the company to do uh, cut pay uh, as a side. Of course, uh, we also look for government uh, stimulate package uh, that uh, whatever government uh, subsidy, uh, it have to come in time or based on the different uh, nature. Uh, we are in the travel line. Uh, uh, there are countries who are able uh, to give subsidies about 60 to 90% for six months. Uh, there are countries who are giving the 75% of uh, uh, salary uh, uh, support uh, package. That's why we also look forward that uh, our government is able to have a more friendly uh, stimulate package to our uh, agency or to all the industrial players in Malaysia. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, thank that you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a follow up question there. Uh, yeah. At the moment, uh, your company alone and the companies that you deal with, um, can you give us an indication now of uh, the sorts of different exercises that you are taking with your staff? You know? uh, are you going through retrenchment? How hard are you trying to retain your staff? And what are some of the uh, measures that you are doing to try and keep your staff? gainfully employed during this very uh, uh, trying period? Uh, yes, uh, for two reasons, I think uh, one of the uh, big components for our expenses is manpower. I think most of the, most of the, most of, most of the industrial players, uh, I mean, if I, talk, if I have to talk about agency, I think 65% of our cost is manpower. So, uh, as I mentioned just now, our COVID-19 in fact started uh, on the 22nd of January. That means to say by March, uh, our, our, our business is already being affected. So, uh, there are companies who already started to doing uh, pay cut or unpaid leave uh, exercise. Uh, but there are companies who are uh, just doing the, uh, the, this exercise by March and April. But on forcing that, uh, I think easily you are talking about 40% of the company who is either go for uh, unpaid leave or pay cut or even uh, for a very drastic uh, measurement to have uh, detriment uh, in the very near future. So, uh, leading on to a point that you said earlier on, um, yep. how, how long do you think travel agencies can hold out given the situation? before we see more travel agencies starting to either close down or to retrench more of their staff? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned just now, uh, for travel agency to operate, I think 65% of our cost is manpower. And uh, at this moment of time, our situation is called uh, zero, uh, zero business situation. That means to say, whatever business we view to have, the customer to really start cancelling. Uh, when do cancel also, they are asking for refund. So uh, that is going to affect our cash flow also. And uh, the other thing, as I mentioned, uh, you know, ever since the COVID-19, uh, the people don't come in uh, at all. And we also foreseeing that uh, that's going to last for another uh, six to nine months. So uh, I think as an agency, uh, we really have no choice. So it's either we talk to our employee uh, to have the pay cut or to have the uh, uh, unpaid list, uh, 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 pay list uh, exercise. So I think that uh, going to be even more serious uh, by this month or next month. Uh, most of the agency will not be able to hold for many months. I will expect that uh, a small, a million size agency will only be able to hold for three to uh, uh, two to three months. Okay, uh, one last question, Dr. String. You also mentioned the wage subsidy earlier on. Now, with the current uh, structure of the wage subsidy, meaning that you have three months wage subsidy, but you have to retain your employees at full pay. Uh, you can't, uh, they can't go on unpaid leave uh, and they can't be uh, retrenched. Uh, how does that, or does that help uh, the travel agency situation at this point? 
I, I must take the opportunity. I must take the opportunity to, uh, to to say thank you to our government that they have uh, come out the stimulate uh, uh, package uh, to all the SME and uh, SMI. Uh, but it is very sad that the agency business is being affected since uh, February. So in fact, a lot of agency already start doing their pay cut or unpaid leave uh, exercise. So to, in order to qualify for our this stimulate package called uh, WSP. And in fact, we are not allowed to uh, have cut pay or unpaid, uh, 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 unpaid, unpaid system. That means to say, most of the travel agency, whether it is small or middle, and as long as you already started doing the uh, exercise, you are not qualified uh, for this uh, stimulate package. That means to say, uh, uh, agency, whether you're involved about, you are not really having any support, uh, uh, any, uh, you are not enjoying any uh, a subsidy from the government stimulate package. Okay, thank you very much, Datuk Sri. Okay, thank you. Now, with the wage subsidy, we've also received a lot of feedback. Uh, it's a 50-50, but many people are quoting uh, neighboring countries like Singapore, and even some countries as far away as the UK, which are offering much higher uh, wage subsidies uh, to the travel and tourism industry in order for the industry to remain competitive. Uh, now, that being said though, we understand that the government may still be looking at different ways to assist the tourism industry. And on that note, I would like to invite uh, YB Nancy, our minister, uh, to give us an idea of what the ministry or the government is currently doing uh, any policies they may be putting in place or any new strategies they may have in order to help the travel industry, the tourism industry, weather the storm. Uh, Wiley, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've heard Tato just now. Um, uh, he was also mentioning about the wage subsidy. And uh, of course, the government has um, tried its very best uh, as possible to mitigate the situation. Well, you know, I think uh, Nigel has met that I kept saying that, you know, we feel the difficulties faced by those affected. And uh, MOTEC is striving hard to ensure that we can help spur the economy by working together with the stakeholders to put Malaysia economy back on track. Of course, it is not, it, it is not really that simple. We, because we feel the suffering, one business closed, many families are affected, many more relations will be out of job, many will be deprived of food on the table. And uh, the government has also announced um, um, the package, the, the stimulus package, um, from the earlier ones until the latest, as per what we have discussed. I remember the industry players came to me and I brought the uh, Minister of Finance to also discuss with us so that we could hear what exactly is needed by the industry players. Of course, having having heard uh, the, the feedback from the industry players, we tried our very best and um, and then as MOTAC, from what the, the, minister, the, the Ministry of Finance uh, came up with for the, the general uh, public and those who are badly affected, uh, regardless of which industry they are from, people have been, uh, every, almost everyone has been taken into account. Now, for Motec itself, we, we, uh, we took this um, opportunity to plan. We have this re uh, tourism recovery plan for tourism manpower. And uh, we are already planning to use this time to enhance the quality of tourism services through online training for tourism manpower, especially the uh, frontliners. Actually, we have submitted our um, our proposals to the uh, through the Economic Action Council or EAC for minimum training allowances for us to um, to run the training online, especially to assist uh, the. Um, uh, the tourism, the tourist guides. I was just um, talking to Dato Ko before before the session started. You see, um, I think it's time for us to to really look into the whole strategy of of um, re rebounding, re rebounding the economy through tourism. So we are constantly 
um, discussing on the strategy and also the action plan. Now, if we if we heard from other countries as well, everybody is talking about domestic tourism. So we are now focusing on how we can um, um, try to refocus on training, especially to focus on domestic tourism, um, looking into the the uh, assets or the strengths of the culture that we have, the the, um, the spots or locations in every every place locally, because people are already to talking about domestic tourism. And apart from that, uh, we are also looking into uh, exempting license fee for tourist guide, tour operators, and travel agencies. This is something that we're also putting up. We hope that that will be approved. Uh, but all these are already in place that we buy, uh, we buy, we have already submitted to make sure that um, this will lighten the burden of the industry players. And of course, maybe some of you also know that there are also um, uh, matching grants, uh, matching grants known as Galakan Melanchong in Malaysia, the Gamelan, and also grants of Hongan Pelancongan, Seni dan Budaya for domestic marketing and promotion activities. And also, um, my domestic programs, as well as organizing tourism, arts, and cultural programs in Malaysia. Apart from that, we are also uh, looking into how to restore confidence of tourists to travel again. Even, even, um, even tourists, the local tourists travel within the country. I think, I think in the under, when, if you see the new norm, the people are now getting very uh, cautious. Uh, they are uh, worried about um, the, the environment. If you see people because of the SOPs under MCO, it trains people to look, to give priority to health, okay? To health um, safety. And well, while looking at the, um, the health of, whereby we, are, we want to give priority to the health of the people, but we, we also cannot neglect the health of the economy. So further on, we, we also look into how we can strengthen or boost domestic tourism via Chuti Chuti Malaysia campaign. Back to this Chuti Chuti Malaysia campaign, uh, well, too bad we have to cancel the, the Visit Malaysia year. 2020 campaign but the thing is uh, uh, now i think uh, it is time for us to refocus on domestic tourism whereby um, we we are strategizing on um, the the various aspects uh, not only we're looking at tourism spots in rural areas or in areas that have never been explored before we are also looking into storytelling. You know, storytelling in terms of um, the the toko toko in certain certain areas in the the the, the areas whereby we tend to neglect before this. Uh, the toko that can that can uh, that have influence over the people who have legacies in their own um, uh, in their own wherever they are they are from. And this eventually, apart from being a local uh, tourism, eventually one day uh, this will also pull uh, foreign uh, foreign tourists to come to all these small places. Again, this is where the travel agents will also have to work together with us. We do the promotion for you. We do the promotion, but we need more innovative and also creative programs, uh, thinking and programs by the industry players vis-a-vis um, -vis the the, uh, tourism, the travel agencies, the uh, tour operators, you know, and uh, tourist guides. I think they need to um, explore further. What are the things that we can look into? And um, apart from that, uh, we would also like to encourage all tourism and industry uh, to um, work with Mortec as a family to explore effective solutions amid the COVID-19. Now, um, actually, if you see, I mean, if any of you follow um, 
our website under Motec, we have the various agencies. We are doing online competition during the MCO. The reason being, we want to stimulate economy among the people, especially, uh, for example, we have the artists, you know, we have theater artists, we have uh, the um, uh, artists who have their pen paintings in our palais, Nilukis, in the museum, those who have stories about the museum, those who have um, something that they can share with the people. Even uh, singing, now singing, we bring people together to sing, but they are all competing with each other. And apart from that, now we are also looking into, uh, well, actually it's an ongoing thing now, um, weavers. Weavers, um, we are not just uh, marketing online for them, but we are also assisting them to market um, online while they are weaving so that there will be interactive um, online uh, marketing for them. So apart from all this, we have all our agencies involved in online competition and give the prizes. As I, I, I shared with my, my team in Motec, uh, we need to help the people to put food on their table because we feel for them. And then, you know, all the celebration of the festivals are coming up even though it's still during MCO, but people still want to eat, you know, maybe in their own homes. They, they, they need money. They need to help their family. They need to, um, they, they need their, their um, some more, I mean, they, they need to help the family to, to get together and all this need money. So we try our very best to help the people to at least uh, stimulate the economy within the country. So these, well, these are amongst them. Actually, there are more. There are more that I can uh, share with you. But the main thing is we want to make sure that our industry players are um, working together with us. Uh, we we will be in promotion for you. You know, we even talked this morning. I was uh, with a group of people who promoted, uh, who, who suggested to us that we should have um, Selamat Silaturahim, they call it. It's a new thing that, you know, that gets people together, the local communities uh, to get together uh, through online. Okay, a lot of activities are done online now. But we, we, um, we try our very best to share with the people what, what they can do. And uh, on just um, slightly before we started, I, I shared about how this new um, approach will also be used to um, strengthen family bonding. And maybe Raya will be different from before, apart from having it online. And if they want to go back to their kampong, perhaps this is the time travel agents uh, will have to relook into the usage of um, uh, tour buses. Because I think tour buses are very badly hit, very badly hit. And also the tour guides, they need to learn new stories now, new things to explore locally. So I think um, th these are things I don't want to touch on stimulus package anymore because I think uh, we have heard so much about it, unless uh, you want me to talk about, you know, all those that had been uh, assisted, you know, the, the assistance given to the people. So um, I think um, those are new things that we are doing in terms of um, plans. Actually, there are more, more to that that uh, we are planning, but we just hope that uh, we, can, we can let the people uh, get still uh, get together through online. This time online is very interesting. They can get, take pictures and uh, they can uh, participate through online and show, show the, to, the, to the people what are among the, the best places in, the, in where they are staying. So um, I think Nigel, um, I, I can stop there for a time being. Uh, perhaps there are questions later, then we can, we can move on. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you, YB. Uh, YB, just before you move on to that, Sham. Uh, just uh, a point there, uh, we've actually had quite a lot of innovation as far as travel agencies are 
concern. Uh, last couple of days, we actually got news that travel agencies are now using their manpower to deliver vegetables. So <laughs> if you need creativity at the end of the, uh, the pandemic, you can count on us. Uh, that being said though, uh, YB, we do have one pressing question that we would like you to quickly comment on. Uh, there have been calls by the industry uh, because the EIS, although it has helped about half the industry, there are indications that the industry says they require a longer period for this EIS in order to sustain the tourism workforce. Uh, and that's because even with domestic tourism in play, uh, many of the industry players, uh, especially those among the travel agencies, will still not be able to recoup enough, uh, given that most domestic travelers will travel independently. Uh, so my question, uh, YB, is that even with the economic stimulus package announced as it is, uh, would you be able to give us an indication if there is anything else that the government may be considering in the pipeline, for example, an extension to the EIS? Maybe your thoughts on that quickly. Um, actually, um, yeah, I forgot to, to mention to you that actually we have submitted another request. Okay, it's a long list of requests based on what we have obtained from uh, the industry players because they have been giving us feedback and we don't want to miss it out. Okay, we know there are quite a number that, um, which if I mention, is quite a long list that had been given to me and I have already forwarded to, uh, to, uh, the Minister of Finance. We hope to hear from him. Actually, I was supposed to get in touch with him to, to, to get uh, his approval, but of course he can approve alone because we are talking about um, uh, financial uh, projection. We're also talking about um, the impact on our, our country's uh, finance. Uh, but rest assured that, uh, well, uh, I have already forwarded that. I cannot promise because uh, I'm not the authority to do so. But we have already actually have, have submitted it again last week, and I was told that uh, we we'll try to we will try to reconsider. Uh, and of course, I've been very hard. You know, you have heard what he said about how I've been pushing because I I think uh, it's time for us to try to see how the country can you know can assist. Uh, um, all industries, especially the most, the, the very, the worst badly uh, affected industry that is our tourism industry. And as you know, uh, we have been um, uh, receiving so many guests before that in 2019, and now um, it's almost zero because everything is already, um, you know, all are uh, pressured under the uh, lockdown. And apart from that, as I said, I forgot to mention also, uh, whereby uh, we requested the hotels to be used as quarantine center, because this is also one way for us to assist of not all hotels um, are qualified because of the distance, but uh, that's the reason why uh, we want the hotels to be used. Actually, even the buses, I was thinking of the buses as well, but of course, um, we, we'll have to see, but no promise on that. I've been pushing for buses to be used as well. Uh, but no promise because um, um, if we want the buses to be used, as I said, it has to be paid by the government as well. Uh, of course, they have to work out on that as well because they have to give priority. Uh, based on what you have questioned me, uh, I, I've already um, put it up in my request. I think I have more than 10 in my list, uh, uh, the latest list that I've submitted last week. And I hope to hear from, um, from uh, the minister to indicate to me uh, uh, what are the things that might be granted and what are the things that they might be able to consider in terms of maybe extending, you know, extending the time for repayment, uh, well, all those I can hint to you. That's uh, the only thing that I can hint to you for now. Uh, but we are working on it. Uh, but I, I hope that uh, those, uh, I mean, everyone, industry players, whatever that you think that, um, perhaps that need to be assisted, perhaps we have left it out, uh, please bring it forward. I, of, of course, I cannot promise, but at least, you know, at least we try. There's no harm trying, you see? No harm trying. We just hope that everybody will be um, able to feel, or um, at least they, they feel that they have been heard, you know, like, like what we did before that. We did not give up, you know, after the first stimulus. Um, after that, we still feel that, you know, 
the industry uh, players are mostly some of them they are not being included in any of the 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 classes of the of those who are given assistance because of the confusion so um, we have tackled that and then uh, we want to tackle more of those who have not been which we have not been uh, able to decide yet i know you're talking about some of them talking about the cancellation of the flights and they are they're asking for refund you know um this is something that is not easy not easy for for um for for you to decide uh well um uh, I'm not so sure of what else can be done. Perhaps the lawyer can advise us on uh, uh, if they do not comply, if they go by the, the by their contracts. But all these, all these require us to um, sit down together and then uh, brainstorm how best can we can we uh, solve the problem. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Waimi. Uh, we wish you luck. Our fingers are crossed. Uh, please continue. Thank you. Continue pray. <laughs> pray. The best thing <laughs> is to pray. <laughs> yeah, thank we you will. very much. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gents, we're going to move the uh, discussion a little bit now. And we're going to look at some of the realities that employers are facing. Uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit because we've got questions that are coming in hard and fast. So I'm just going to push the questions in here, uh, like what we did with uh, Wiley and Nancy earlier on. Um, let's go to Dr. Sham. Dr. Sham, um, yes. a quick question here. Uh, what is the perspective of the MEF with regards to the current situation and the stimuli that was announced by the government, uh, especially with regards to tourism businesses, uh, especially for service-oriented businesses like travel agencies and tour operators? Um, is it a sustainable solution uh, or are more measures uh, required? And also, if there's any other particular circumstance that you've come across that is unique or particularly affecting the tourism industry and, and its ability to retain talent. Uh, Dr. Sham, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sri Nancy had mentioned about the fact that the uh, tourism industry was very badly affected. I, I, couldn't disagree with that. And if you look at uh, the current figures of retrenchment, up to March uh, the year, there were about more than 15,000 employees already retrenched. And uh, the biggest industry that contributed to that is the tourism industry. More than 5,000 employees were retrenched already in this year. Of course, the second one was the, the, the manufacturing sector. But this is just, I would say, the tip of the iceberg. And we had seen that quite a number of big hotels decided to call it off early. And of course, they will add to the numbers of retrenchment. And of course, uh, Mia had come up with a, a forecast that if you are not handling this particular issue uh, well, then possibly there will be more than 2.4 million employees retrenched this year. And that is, I think, very boring. But on the other, on the other hand, of course, uh, we also have this forecast by the by the DOSH, Department of Statistics, it says that possibly this year you'll see something like 1.1 million employees retrenched from all over the sector. And if we take this particular phenomena, then of course we are talking about what is the prospect of employment for everybody this year. Yeah, of course, currently we have about half a million people unemployed. They do uh, the, the unemployment rate currently. And of course, we would say that this year, for the new entrance of the labor market, which is about half a million, it's very, very difficult for them to get a job. That is only one million, plus the one million that is being forecasted to have been entrenched this year. So this year, we are talking about something like 13% unemployment, two million or more. Yeah? And that is what is the current rate of unemployment in the USA, actually, arising from this uh, COVID-19. And of course, we are talking about the stimulus packages especially for the tourism industry. I would say that the 15% the reduction in electricity, the, the, what the, the, the tax uh, you know, uh, incentive for the individual of 1,000, I think that is, I would say, very negligible impact. You know, I would say that yeah, because uh, I think it's not going to attract uh, what uh, Dr. Sri Nancy said just now, but trying to attract lo local tourism. It needs to be something beyond that. And of course, you're talking about the wage subsidy and also the other subsidies. 
Let me just uh, talk a bit about the Employment Re Retention Program, the ERP. Yeah, you, it's, it's, I would say on paper, a very good program. Yeah, because it gives the chance for the, the, the employees to be subsidized with 600 ringgit uh, for six months. Yeah. But what is the reality? The reality is basically that fund allocated for ERP, about 120 million only, was completely being, I would say, earmarked to be disbursed by April 6. So by all April 6, already there were 300,000 employees listed under that program. And anybody that apply beyond 6 of April, the chances of their, their application being approved is very negligible unless the government pump in more money into that ERP. So, so, so that I think is something perhaps the government need to look at seriously in trying to encourage employers not to retrench employees, but retain their employees on a longer term. And let us just quickly look at the subsidy. Yeah. What is the amount of subsidy the government had given the private sector, yeah, including the tourism industry? The first subsidy was 5.9 billion and was increased by another 7.9 billion, 13.5 billion, 13.8 billion. But is, is that enough to actually attract employers not to retrench employees? Yeah. And I would say that that fund, it is appreciated, but it's too little to be of uh, significant to, uh, to encourage employers not to retrench. We are talking about a subsidy of less than 17% of the wages bill in the private sector. We are talking about at least 27.5 27 uh, billion uh, subsidy in a year. So, so that I think is something that perhaps we need to relook and perhaps the government need to actually come up with a more attractive wages subsidy like what had been mentioned earlier, talking about possibly 80% like, like in, in UK, talking about up to 75% in Singapore, thing like that. So, so it's uh, important for the government to really rescue the private sector for the time being, because if without the private sector, then the 90% of the job opportunities in the private sector or the whole of Malaysia is at stake because the government only offered about 10% of the job opportunities. So the private sector is the, actually the engine of, of employment as far as Malaysia is concerned. And this need to actually be assisted for them to retain their employees on a longer note. But of course, another part, of course, we had heard about wage cut, wage reduction, unpaid leave, thing like that. But the situation is basically when the government first announced the MCO, the Ministry of Human Resources and the National Secretary Council came up with a statement to say that no you employers must pay full wages and allowances during the MCO. So here we are during the MCO. Like that was Rico had mentioned that it's zero revenue basically during this period, zero base. So how, how are you going to pay your wages when actually it, it is about 60%, for example, in the tourism industry that it must be coming from the revenue. So without the revenue and you are expected to actually pay wages, of course, it is uh, not, uh, I would say, a good business sense if you actually borrow from the bank to pay the wages. It is not possible in that manner. So, so, so I, I would say that more things need to be, to be done on, on that aspect. Yes, of course, the, the suspension of HRBF for Sigma, they would assist a bit the industry, but HRBF is only 1%. So SMEF, actually, we had suggested that why not we relook at our EPF contribution? Because as employers, we also contributed about 12% for employees uh, below uh, below 5,000 uh, above, above 5, and below 5,000 ringgit, we pay 13%. So that is quite a big chunk. So as MEF, we say that, okay, we need to be fair. We need, we need to actually reduce that EPF contribution by, by, by reducing it to 5%. Ironically, in the stimulus package, second stimulus package announced by the Prime Minister, giving the example that actually the, the Mikolo seller and thing like that can save some money from the EPF exemption. But if you look at the text of the speech, there's nothing mentioned about EPF exemption. So this is something that possibly the government need to relook at that, whether it is possible or not for the government to now say that, okay, look, let us look at the EPF employees contribution for the time being, and perhaps uh, we try to reduce it to a more manageable level so that of course, I think the more important part is whether we remain employed or not for the time being, rather than 
really looking at the old age. Because if you are not having any employment at all, then there is no point for us to talk about EPF savings, things like that. And of course, uh, the, the important part is also basically, you know, when we have the MCO. The doctrine and MC talks about trying to balance between the health of the employees, the health of the public, and that of the health of the economy. Of course, the health of the economy currently is bleeding. And we seem to be quite successful in, in terms of managing COVID-19 infection. Yeah, so that, I think, is something that I think uh, is a, a good effort by the government as a whole. And, and of course, what, what can happen after this is hopefully that, yes, we can still have the MCO on. But for employers to kickstart their businesses, they need to be allowed to operate. Yeah? Is it in the current form? Of course, the current form is, I would say, very, very confusing, very, very difficult for us to get through the program. Because say, for example, you know, when we were asked to apply to, to MITI for, for us to be exempted from the MCO, then, of course, you know, the first day, the MITI, MITI uh, website crashed. Yeah? And, 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 of course, you know, currently, there are a lot of issues about that. So, as MEF, we had even suggested to the government to say that, why not you just allow us to operate on a smaller scale basis. Yeah? Say, for example, 30% or one third of the, the workforce are allowed to actually go for, for work, but then the whole country may be still under MCO, but the company should be allowed to operate so that when, when you, once you are able to operate, then you are going to be able to save the jobs. Yeah? So, so that I think is very, very critical. And to me, there is no point for us to go and apply to meet anything like that. MITI should have just set the parameters. What are the conditions for you to operate? And employers that are willing to abide by the condition can just go and operate. Yeah? And of course, it's up to the government to enforce their SOP kind of thing. And if any employer is found to be flouting the, the, the condition, then they can be asked to stop working. Yeah? So, so this, I think, is very, very important for us to, to kickstart the economy. If we are not able to do that, then of course, it's going to be very difficult for us to actually maintain the, the economy, or even talking about trying to encourage uh, do domestic tourism. So that's all, Nigel, for the time being. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shang. In fact, uh, we had quite a number of questions that we wanted to ask you, but it seems that you've already addressed most yeah. of them. Uh, we'll get back to you shortly because the questions yeah, sure. are still coming in yeah. hard and fast. Uh, just a quick uh, request for our panelists. There seems to be a little bit of background noise. Uh, so yeah. if you're not speaking, uh, we request that you mute your mic. No, no uh, problem. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now, like I said, the questions are still coming in hard and fast, but uh, before we go to some of these questions, uh, we'd like to actually take a look at the practicality of uh, what, what our labor laws are in this current situation and how they apply. So uh, the next person I'd like to invite to give a little bit of insight into this is uh, Mr. Sengfilm. And uh, basically the question is, uh, are our current labor laws practical uh, during this time of crisis? And what should businesses do if they are considering restructuring their workforce? What are some of the options that we as business owners have? Over to you, Santel. Thanks, Nigel. Um, let me break it up into two parts. Um, the practicality of the labor laws, um, at this particular time, it's been called into question because a lot of employers feel that their hands have been tied by a lot of requirements. The labor laws are there essentially to protect the employees. Um, once the, the, the protections that are there in the legislation, in the case law are set out, employers also know the parameters within which they have to work. So the basic underlying principle is that it's there to protect employees. Um, gives the guidelines for the employers. And these laws are supposed to apply to all sectors, all categories of employees at all times. At this particular moment in time, we are facing something we have not faced before. So like I said earlier, the laws are in the way of certain employers trying to implement certain things. But I think the important thing to remember is, um, this is not something that employers can uh, do on their own. Uh, there are certain provisions in the law that allow you to take certain, certain steps, but there are also certain uh, protections for the employees which require you to engage with the employees in implementing what you want to implement. 
I think um, as uh, Dato Sri Ko mentioned in the beginning, a lot of companies have already started uh, putting into place programs, either whether it's wage card, paid leave, from March. So it already shows that there is a give and take between employer and employee. So the practicality of the laws, I think, are a little uh, irrelevant at the moment. Um, what is important is the uh, relationship between employer and employee. Uh, the second part of your question is a little longer, and I think it also is going to overlap with some of the questions that are coming out from your pen, uh, from your from the attendees of the forum. What do you do when you're considering a uh, structuring of the workforce? I know these are times when you want to co cut costs, but really you should talk to a lawyer or an HR practitioner. Um, if you can't get hold of one, look for resources that can help you. I mean, Marta has put out an FAQ, which is quite useful. It sets out some of the things that you can do. It gives you an overview of uh, steps and things that you can uh, have to know, have to account for. And the gaps that are there, you can try and fill up by other resources or speaking to someone to make sure that whatever you do, you do it in a manner that's compliant with laws, which is important. Because you don't want to take steps which in the short term save you money or in the long term cause you to have more exposure or more liability. Um, what else do you do when you want to restructure your workforce? Communication with your work staff. That I think is one of the key things to do because a lot of the, a lot of the steps that uh, companies uh, explore when they are trying to reduce costs are things like reducing work hours, <coughs> limiting working days, unpaid leave for an agreed period. These are things that you cannot do on your own. These are things um, that you need to talk to your employees because, about because employment is like, it's a contractual relationship. And like any contract, one party can't decide they want to change it on their own. It involves both parties agreeing. So communication with your employees is important. Test your financial position. Know what you need, how much cost you have to cut, and what you need to do to achieve the cost savings. Because saving the tourism workforce is not just about, um, okay, I'm going to have to do a retrenchment. I am going to have to let certain staff go. You can't just look at it from the perspective of the staff you have to let go because you're still trying to save a business, trying to keep the business running, try to keep the business running for the employees that are there and uh, try and ride out this period so that when things turn around, we're ready to catch up, let's go. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Chantel. Um, Just leading on to that question, though, there are one or two questions that were submitted earlier on. Uh, and these uh, we did not address in our guidelines, but it's an interesting question nonetheless. Uh, one of these questions was, uh, and I quote, I have no more money and I have to retrench employees. What will happen if I can't pay retrenchment benefits? Um, okay. <laughs> Maybe that was a shaman wants to oh, take. So no, because I just to an answer that, because uh, basically, of course, it's not as simple as that. Yes. But employees, they are entitled to go either to the labor department or to the labor court or the national court. Yeah. And of course, there are provisions within the law, you know, the Industrial Relations Act, and also under the Employment Act that actually allows the government to actually go after the individual directors and also the individual top managers of the company because they are jointly and severally liable. It means that if the company have no money, then the directors or the top managers will be personally liable to pay for the termination benefits or the retrenchment benefit. But of course, this is meant more for the people under the Employment Act. For those people who are above 2,000 ringgit, generally speaking, there is no provision for retention benefit or termination benefit that depends on their contract. Well, of course, I mean the least that the employees be entitled is the notice period or payment in the in the in the payment in lieu of notice period. So there is in simple form uh, the liability of the company to address the issues of termination benefits or retention benefits when you retrench. Yeah? Thank you. So sorry, Nigel. It's all right. Thank you. I said it better myself. Okay, fantastic. Um, look, we're just going to uh, shift focus a little bit here while we get through some of the many, many questions that are coming through. Um, 
let's look at the slightly more positive side of things. Now that uh, employees are stuck at home on MCO, we've got some questions coming through that ask, what can we practically get our employees to do now that they are working from home? And when the MCO is lifted, uh, return to the workforce is still going to be gradual. Uh, how do we gradually rebuild operations given the current situation? Maybe on this note, uh, Dato Suiko, can you share with us some of the things that your company is doing, uh, planning for what your employees should be doing now, and when the workforce is able to come back uh, to work physically? Yeah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, in fact, the, uh, the, I think most of the agency are now uh, having a home working uh, situation at this moment. Because uh, even after the MCO is listed, uh, I don't think that the, uh, we will allow uh, full force uh, people in the office because they was talking about the safety concerns also. So I think most of the agency now is talking about uh, the uh, SOP in the office. It means to say uh, we also wanted to uh, allow minim uh, minimum people in the office and uh, to make sure that uh, everything is uh, being done uh, in the safety uh, manner. Thank you very much, Dr. Sri. Uh, anybody else would like to chip in here? Uh, maybe perhaps Dr. Shang, have you heard of anything that uh, other employees are doing to keep uh, uh, employees uh, occupied uh, constructively during this time? Yeah, perhaps uh, just to share, uh, one, I would say, which is considered as a best practice in, in even in, a, in, in the world, where if you are talking about the financial crisis in 98, 99, uh, this particular company was involved in the high-end car, you know, be, uh, servicing. And of course, they have many, uh, uh, I would say, expert uh, technicians within their, their employment. But of course, even during the good times, uh, even the, the rich people cannot send their car for servicing, thing like that. And, and of course, what the company had done was to consider whether they want to retrench this employee or to retain them. So what the company had done was to actually pay a certain amount of wages, certain percentage, and allow the employee to be on long-term leave. And during that period, the employee is allowed to do any work at all. You know, not, not related to the company's work, but any work at all outside, and they still pay a certain amount of wages during that period. And of course, uh, with the intention that when the economy recover, then the, em the employee would still have the ready, uh, ready employees that are very skillful and can be called back to work anytime. And that's what exactly happened. And this particular practice was, in fact, recognized by the ILO as one of the best practices to be implemented by companies during the hard times. So in, in the sense that actually retrenchment is not uh, something that is encouraged. This is a matter of last resort. And basically, of course, if you can, you should retain your, your, your skilled employee so that when the economy recover, then you quickly can actually get the benefits of the economic recovery. Otherwise, then you have to re-employ, retrain and see whether your, your, your new recruits are suitable for your requirements or not. And that is a very costly affair, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sham. Uh, why do you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. Um, hearing what uh, Dr. Sham said, I, th I agree with him. I think we need to keep them uh, involved and keep them busy and occupied with, with new things. It depends on what they're interested to do. That's why, in back to MoTeC, what we are doing, we are encouraging people to participate in our our programs in our activities, apart from us paying them money, but at the same time, we are trying to encourage people to be uh, fully occupied with all sorts of talents. All sorts of talents, you know, um, when we talk about artists, uh, talk, talking about artists, um, we are trying to get them to spread that kind of talents when they, are, when they appear in the video, um, they can also try to influence, influence the others to, to encourage new skills for them. So uh, that is one example. And uh, there's also even dancing. 
the steps, the dancing steps, is part of what the culture is all about. We're talking about how they, for example, joke it, you know, because this is in this kind of um, a break that we are having, apart from doing something that is more depressing, um, you know, all the activities that we're trying to, to, to introduce through online, uh, activities that could help people to uh, create new, new talents, new talents among the people. Well, besides that, I was, if you um, heard earlier on, I talked about storytelling and I thought it was just something that is just a um, um, uh, thought, uh, thought from myself. But when we had our um, video conferencing, our, our meeting with the others from the other countries and internationally, they are also talking about storytelling because this is a new way for people to to think about how best they can improve and also um, promote promote their own local um, local um, communities, even in terms of food. And I think now you can see a lot of talents in terms of those who can cook. You know, because this will be uh, this we can build new talents because having involved in culinary, it can also help people to earn a living. And um, a lot of things that can be done during the break, the MCO break, that that um, that we can see new talents are building up. You know, apart from those who are um, talented in in music, but at the same time, they are also doing deep critical thinking about what what can we do for our own country. And this is going back to our own country. Um, the best thing is when I, I, I heard a lot of views from people We're talking about building relationships, which I mentioned earlier on, but not only that, that relationship is not just among the, 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 uh, their siblings, but with the extended families. People are not focusing on even looking into um, family trees. So these are something that would create values among the people. I'm trying to see... Um, how else can they participate in our uh, activities through the things that we are already um, sharing with people? But main thing is, of, of course, we are trying to get people to earn, to earn a living or even to earn something extra for themselves during this um, MTO break. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wadi. Uh, we've also heard, yes, a lot of people are starting to look at other options within the tourism sector. So we can only hope that at this point in time, people will start to innovate and be creative. Uh, that being said, Wiley, there is a question that came in uh, specifically uh, regarding uh, what the government is uh, doing. Um, I'm going to paraphrase it because there are a few questions like this. Uh, so it, from Timothy Till, for example, we've got a question coming in that says, uh, we've read in the national papers that the government is looking to use money set aside for Tourism Malaysia's promotion and marketing to pay for the current stimulus. Uh, another question is, uh, is the government using the tourism sector allocation to fund the stimulus package and shouldn't the government use the money for tourism companies first? Yeah, at the moment, uh, Nigel, thank you for that question. At the moment, um, we, we have to justify why we should keep the money with, uh, for ourselves. I mean, when I say for ourselves, it's more for tourism industry uh, because at the moment, um, actually, it has not been used for stimulus package. Um, we, we are intending to assist our own industry players um, in terms of um, providing them assistance um, to assist uh, among the 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 uh, tour guides, uh, even among the tour operators or the travel agents, we have all those in 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 our plans. But of course, um, again, uh, we have to justify this on why we should keep it and why we should be using it. Maybe using about how many percent of it for our industry players. Um, we have submitted that, and uh, again, we have not had any response for that. But it is um, gearing towards that. It's gearing towards that. 
a certain percentage of it because we are no longer using it for visit in this year. But of course, promotion has to be continuously uh, carried out. Uh, otherwise, um, the industry will not be uh, growing. Uh, so, with regards to the, the funds, uh, we still have the funds with us. We cannot simply use it for anything else except um, except if we have the, the permission to do whatever we want to do. And because we are supposed to return some part of our funds to the uh, federal, uh, to, the, to the government, and uh, of course they have their own plans to maybe to assist the, the people further. But on our part, in our tech, uh, it's still with us. We have not done anything yet. Of course, some of it, we are using it for our, our activities. Uh, in terms of um, what we are already doing now. But there's still a um, lot of it because, I mean, as you know, uh, the funds have been um, allocated for our, for our visit in this year, 2020, and uh, we are going to use it um, to the best uh, for the tourism uh, industry players uh, for them to, uh, to um, to look into their own, uh, I'm, I'm sure, in terms of their financial um, financial liabilities, you know, those with regard to their tourism activities. So this is what uh, we we have put forward. Uh, as I told you, the list was very long. We have put forward, and uh, we have not received anything yet because it was just not last week. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Vaidi. Uh, guys, we're going to wrap this up very soon. Um, and uh, before we, we take around with the panelists, we'll give you a bit of a parting message. Uh, we do have one more slightly off-topic question by an anonymous attendee, uh, again for uh, YD Minister, which is not actually related to this topic, but a very interesting question if you could give us an insight as well. Uh, it actually reads, what is Motec doing to assure inbound visitors that Malaysia is safe to visit. Uh, will we be giving out masks or sanitizers? Post SARS in post SARS in 2003, Hong Kong made huge efforts to draw back tourism and ensure visitors there was increased hygiene. So a little bit off topic, YD, but important because inbound is the lifeblood of the country. If you could, yeah. Uh, for that, for now, we are not doing that because it's already been done through other agencies like NADMA, whatever that we. Have whatever uh, is given, uh, even sponsored by any uh, CSR projects, is going to NADMA because it is not directly dealt through us at the moment. Well, we hope that this will be a habit uh, among the people. And I think uh, the people are planning for, for, um, for troubles in the future. This is what they are looking for. Apart, I mean, apart from looking for uh, places for them to visit, they want to make sure that the place is safe for them to visit. And also, hygienically, we need to, to make sure that we enhance uh, in terms of hygiene so that this will build the confidence among the people to visit the place again. Because they, as they recall, they have, when they have been to the place and it's nice and they want to go again, but all these factors hygiene factors will be top priority to them. And um, at the moment, in terms of giving away sanitizers or masks, um, we are not doing it yet because everything is at the lockdown um, um, break. But the thing is, uh, well, perhaps maybe in the future, this will be a um, trend among us. Uh, well, I hope that you know that will be uh, uh, will be one of our agenda in the future. Thank you for that uh, particular question that will make us uh, remind us about what we're going to do in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, YB. Uh, so, ladies and gents, we're going to wrap up very shortly. Uh, but just before we do, maybe a quick uh, takeaway point from each panelist: something that you feel is very pertinent to the travel industry, particularly travel agents on how they can uh, look at retaining, mitigating the effects of this uh, manpower loss in this current situation. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Srikko. Some practical advice from you? Uh, yeah, the, the basically, the first of all, I'd like to say thank you for Mata to organize this uh, bread and butter uh, conference. 
And uh, in fact, uh, I totally agree with what uh, uh, Dato Haji Sansurin is saying that uh, most of the SME and FMI, or especially the tourism player, are having a very difficult uh, situation. And uh, at the same time, also, we hear YB and uh, what the government are doing. But uh, if you would allow me to uh, say on behalf of travel agency, then uh, of course, uh, I think at, at the present stimulate package, uh, it is not uh, very friendly, uh, it is not very helping the travel agency. And uh, I, I still remember the, in fact, our Mata Association is putting a request uh, for tourism to have 20,000 uh, as a token, one time token to support the travel agency. Uh, we'll be able to support 60% of the uh, payroll uh, for six months. Uh, as we also understand that other countries are giving 60 to 90%, or our neighboring country is support 75% up to nine months. And uh, I, I wish our YV uh, will be passing the message to, uh, to the government. Uh, if not, uh, our agency, uh, our tourism agency uh, is really having a, a, a very difficult uh, time. Uh, of course, uh, I think the, all the players, we have to stay positive. And of course, uh, we have to look forward. Uh, we have to have uh, strong uh, de de determination uh, to make sure that uh, we will be able to overcome this COVID-19. Uh, at the same time, we'll be able to uh, get it through for our this uh, very difficult uh, time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sri. Yep. Um, just before we go on to the next panelist, uh, ladies and gents, we've got a quick poll by uh, our media partners, The Star, which has uh, graciously hosted this session for us. Uh, so you may see a little quick poll pop up on your screen shortly. It's only four or five questions. Do take uh, a couple of seconds to answer it while we uh, wrap up this, uh, this session. So uh, YB, any parting words from you? Well, I'd like to thank um, Dato Ko for uh, his suggestion. Um, it will be. It is actually our our uh, session is recorded. Hopefully, my staff will take that up for me. But anyway, it's time for us to bring back the joy of visiting and traveling again. I appeal to everyone to remain united in managing this situation, no matter how great our measures and effort, including government's funding of so many millions incentives and uh, recovery efforts will not mean anything if we lose to COVID-19 and we cannot go back to our lives. Let us beat this one enemy first, then together, you and me, we rebuild industry again. We can, if we do this together. Let us act and pray that the situation will be better soon and tourism will rise above and beyond the actions of COVID-19, inshallah. Thank you very much. And thank you. To thank the you very much. Thank you very much, YB. Uh, over to you, Dr. Sham. Any uh, bits of advice you can give uh, uh, our watchers before we go off? Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, COVID-19 and CO pose a very serious challenge. And it is only fair that this uh, cost burden uh, imposed by MCO and, uh, and uh, COVID-19 should be shared by the employees by the government and the employers. It is uh, totally unfair to expect the employers to fully, fully share this particular burden and it's important for us to actually share the burden so that we are able to save employment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sham. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Sento, over to you. Hi. Okay. Um, going back to the remedies or the options available to uh, employers, I think uh, a few steps that you need to bear in mind, uh, whatever action you decide you want to take. Assess your position, understand the process, consider the options, don't rush into retrenchment because it's not free, that's a cost attached. And at some point you're going to come out of this, you need to make sure that your business is ready to carry on uh, in some form. If you do find yourself in a position where you have to retrench, please make sure that you follow the process. You don't want it coming back to bite you later. And finally, um, uh, labor laws will help some 
people and um, get in the way of other people. Um, the problem faced by the tourism sector at this point, as uh, Dr. Sri Ko mentioned in the beginning, is have zero business. So if you feel that the support from the government is still insufficient, uh, please make your voices. Okay, thank you very much, Santos. Okay, ladies and gents, this about wraps up our program. But uh, before you go, uh, we have another two series upcoming. Uh, the second series, which will be sometime next week, and you'll be advised of it, will look at the banking, finance, and leasing, uh, and some of the challenges faced by travel agencies uh, trying to get some of the loans, and whether it is practical or not to actually even apply for them. Uh, and on the final series, we will be looking at recovery measures. And YB Nancy, we hope to have you back then. Uh, in fact, a lot of the questions tonight uh, actually uh, focus on uh, some of the recovery measures and policies, uh, not just by the private sector, uh, but also more importantly by what the government is planning uh, moving on post MCO and into the COVID-19 uh, recovery session. So ladies and gents, um, we will also be sending out a, uh, some, uh, a link for you to download the infographics that Martha has prepared with regards to the findings we had, as well as a link to our frequently asked questions uh, regarding uh, human resources, labor laws, and what you can do practically in this time of challenge. So once again, thank you very much for tuning in to the series. Uh, it's been a pleasure having all of you, to the panelists. Thank you very much for your time. And we hope thank to have you. you back someday. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you. Take care. On behalf of Mata and the staff, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.